Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. All right, welcome back. This is episode 405. Now, I know I've been a little off the grid as of late, kind of trip out to the uh, South Pasadena Masonic Lodge in Masonic Con, and then I went on a four-day camping trip with my family, which was uh, pretty epic and really fun. Amazing, amazing storms went through, and I don't know how we managed to survive without technology. Even the cell towers in the area all lost power, so there was no cell service. You couldn't even dial 911 from a phone. There was nothing. So thank goodness we did not have to have any emergencies. It was interesting, right? Like we were disconnected, but became more connected. We had nothing to do but talk to each other. So last week I told you guys some really big news. I will repeat a little bit of that, but not go into too much detail. I've got a bunch of things I want to let you guys know about. I've got two great papers coming up. So uh, let's get into the show. First and foremost, every time I go onto Reddit r slash Freemasonry and I see somebody ask for advice on resources for a new Mason or a Mason looking for more education, or sometimes it's as plain as, hey, do you have any new podcasts to listen to? There's always somebody out there who mentions Whence Came You or the WCY podcast and or TMR or the Winding Stairs. And I just want to say thank you so much for the guys out there who tout the WCY podcast and put it out there for other people to listen to. It really means a lot to me to hold me up um, with among a lot of the other Masonic podcasts out there. We've been around probably the longest in terms of a stint, right? Uh, we didn't go dark. We haven't stopped. We're consistent with releasing, which has contributed to the success of the program. Uh, but we couldn't do that without our producers, fellows, and our contributors. So big thanks to you guys as well. But I just want to say thanks. That's all. You guys are awesome for uh, sticking with us through thick and through thin and you know, first and foremost, really what sticks out of my mind is there's a lot of Masonic podcasts out there now. There's like 30 of them. Some are lodge-centric, some are esoteric-based, and I'm just glad to know that you guys still feel like it's a relevant program and we're bringing you material worthwhile. So thanks. Next up, I do want to mention, for the longest time, I haven't been able to have guests on the program. You may remember about a year and a half, two, maybe even three years ago now, when my computer crashed and I said, like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this show anymore because I don't have the cash to just go out and do it. And then I just went out and made a mega charge on my charge card to buy a new computer to continue doing the podcast. My my wife made me do it, actually. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that happened with that was we ran into a glitch. The new computer that I used did not have a specific type of audio setting embedded within the, the programming of the computer or the hardware, which made me have to figure out workarounds. And the workarounds have been rough. And what those allowed me to do was to record interviews. So it's been a difficult process to do interviews. We've done them since, but on occasion, there's a lot of processing, post-processing that goes into doing an interview. So... I haven't been able to do them in a while, but I'm proud to announce that we've got two guys lined up for the program that are going to be coming on. I've dialed in my specifics. We know how to do this for you tech nerds out there like me, your audio files. We're just going to record mono and then dual channel stereo conversion later. But it's going to be great. The same 320 kilobyte audio that you're used to. Really good file. So who am I going to have on the program? Well, I'll have, I've decided I wanted to have Brother Stephen Berryman on the program. He's got a wonderful talent in woodworking and craftsmanship, and I want to have him come on to talk a little bit about being a mason speculatively and also one who does almost the exact same job that I do IRL or in real life, but on the side is a true craftsman as well. Now, I know there's a lot out there. Why did I pick Berryman? Well, I know Berryman and he's a good friend of mine. So I've got a few of his uh, quality products in my office, in my bag, and it's not to promote the work or whatever. I just want to have him on because he's my friend and I think you guys will enjoy his point of view. And we've had a lot of fun uh, in the Texas Masonry Facebook group asking some tough questions and listening to different perspectives from around the state and around the country. There's a lot of other people within that group. So we'll have Stephen Berryman on. Another great guy that I'm going to have on is Brother Patrick Day. He's an editor over at the Rocky Mountain Mason Magazine. Now, I've talked about these guys in the past. You can pick up a subscription, rockymountainmason.com. Go over there. It's $33 for a year. It's a quarterly publication. 
what's really wonderful is it's a, a packed magazine that's got a lot of information in it, but it's varied. There's history, philosophy, current events in every issue. Not necessarily themes on the issue, but uh, it is a wonderful magazine that spans the gamut. And recently, we just did an episode of the Masonic Roundtable on the tarot. If you caught it, awesome. If you didn't, check it out. It's our latest uh, episode, 265, I believe it is. And John Ruark and I got to nerd out a little bit because we both enjoy the tarot and the study and maybe even some practice. And through my discussions with the Rocky Mountain Mason magazine, you know, it turns out they actually put a fool in every issue. You got to find it. How cool is that? So uh, pick up the Rocky Mountain Mason. This is not like an advertisement or anything. I just like the magazine. But I'm going to have the editor, one of the editors, Patrick Day on the program to talk about a multitude of of different things. If you guys enjoyed the series we did on the Shamir that's like spread over three episodes. Brother Patrick actually wrote the main piece that we read in the finale of talking about it, and it was Solomon and his magic and whatnot. And he did such a great job with that, I wanted to reach out and get him on the program. And so we were actually going to get on the other day and record this, and this week was going to be the interview with Brother Patrick Day. So we had to push that out a little bit because of the aforementioned technical difficulties with interviewing and recording. Turns out it's it's kind of difficult without buying a specific device and spending thousands of dollars to record a telephone conversation (laughs) Uh, like it's against the law or something. But anyway, uh, we'll have Brother Patrick on the program as well in the next couple weeks. Look forward to that. Next up is Camp Masonry, a unique Masonic retreat. It's right around the corner, August 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th. There were two guys in the last episode, who came forward and identified the sound that they heard in the beginning of the program. It is actually the pod bay doors from Star Trek The Next Generation from Season 1. I'm a nerd. I threw it in there. I said if you could identify that sound, you would get a free Solomon's Pass. You just have to get to Toledo, Ohio. Now, we had two guys uh, who were able to answer the question. One guy answered it, but he could not attend. Another guy answered it, but also... Turns out the cable toe was a little tighter. He also couldn't attend. So what we did was I let Brother Jason Shammy know, who is the guy behind Camp Masonry, that I would like him to donate the ticket to a brother who is having hardship that would benefit from going. So that's what's going to happen. So if you head on over to CampMasonry.com, wait for a second for the site to load. It will have all of the information there for you to check out. Again, I will be there. Brother Mike Hambrick will be there. Brother Jason Richards from the Masonic Roundtable will be there, as well as a slew of other guests and speakers. It's going to be a great couple days. I hope to see everybody there. And last but not least, in fact, probably the biggest thing I'm really excited about is Chicago Masonicon. Since the last time I've talked to you guys about this last week, uh, I have decided to make it a three-day event, so it's going to be September 18th, 19th, and 20th, 2020. Not a few weeks from now, like 60 weeks away. So what we've got going on is a very traditional event. We are going to have several speakers. I've got 11 speakers over three days. I've got vendors confirmed, and I am shoring up a schedule already. September of 2020. It's a long ways out, but I invite you to go to Masonic Con Chicago. That's Masonic Con Chicago dot com and sign up uh, on the website to get our announcements as those come out. And what we're going to do is go ahead and announce speakers uh, to our subscribers first. And then a few days later, the general updates will go out to everybody else via Facebook and will be available on the website also. So we'll build up some real anticipation around those things. We're going to, we are accepting sponsorships. So you can check out those options as well on our page, Masonicon chicago.com and one of the things that i've had people ask me already is how much are tickets going to be well tickets are going to be a to be determined amount however we will have early bird admission and so those tickets will be a reduced price for a set limited amount of time and the people who will have first dibs at those lower prices are going to be the people who have subscribed to our email newsletter so When tickets go on sale, they will be the first to buy tickets at the reduced rate. Then a week later, they will go up on the website 
at the reduced rate. And then for a limited period of time, we'll have to sell those tickets at a reduced rate and then they'll go to regular price. But we've got a ways off before we get there. We'll announce pricing when we can. The event is going to be limited completely. The entire event will be limited to the first 150 tickets. After that, we're going to be out. So you're going to want to buy early. Uh, No tickets are going to be sold at the door. That's just a headache that nobody wants to deal with. Everybody will have a badge. Everybody will have to show your identification to get into the event. And this is not, I repeat, not a Master Mason only event. There will be in attendance Masons from around the country. There will be in attendance Prince Hall Masons from around the country. There will be the public who is interested in the topics. So please be aware of that. 150 tickets are going to go really fast with such a wide audience. We are also going to have a brewery night, which will be likely the festive board night as well. It's going to be a mixed event with a MC and a speaker, and that is going to be limited to the first 100 tickets sold. The exception will be to executive pass holders. So if we reach capacity, but you're an executive pass holder, you'll be able to get in also. MasonicConChicago.com. Check out the website. Subscribe for updates. If you have questions, go ahead and send those on over. I'm your customer service representative for this event. So this is actually being sponsored by WCY Media, which is uh, what Wentz KMU is produced under, as well as Space Novum, my home lodge, uh, which is under dispensation at the moment. But we believe in this, and my lodge is assisting uh, in all facets. So thank you very much, and we hope to see you at this event too in 60 weeks. It's a long way out, but we're going to keep it in the front of your mind. All right, now after all those news and announcements, I want to get into the education, the real reason we're here, the real reason this show exists. So we'll get into that right now. The first piece I have for you this week is called Buffalo Bill Cody. It's by Ernest J. Gopert Jr., the past Grand Master, Grand Lodge of Wyoming and it was given at the 110th Annual Communication of the Grand Lodge of Wyoming, which was held in Cody, Wyoming, in August of 1984, and was dedicated to the memory of the town's founder, Pony Express writer, scout, frontiersman, showman, Brother William F. Buffalo Bill Cody. Now, one of the reasons I decided to read this piece on the program this week is my son is a lover of the Wild West. In fact, He probably watches a John Wayne movie Western every week. And he runs around the house with uh, his guns and dressed like a cowboy. And, you know, he's eight years old and he just loves it. And I love it too. So this was kind of a cool piece to be able to read given its Western frontiersman topic. Uh, This short talk bulletin has been adapted from one of the presentations at that memorable annual communication at the Grand Lodge of Wyoming in 1984. A child destined to great fame was born on a farm in LeClaire, Scott County, Iowa, on February 26, 1846, to Isaac Cody and Mary Leacock Cody. Isaac abandoned his farm to work as a stage driver, and the family moved to the vicinity of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. At the age of 11, Bill lost his father in the Kansas Border War. Bill's mother was a woman of the highest character and developed in him nobility of soul, fortitude, and courage which endeared him to the hearts of all who were destined to meet and know him. She died when Bill, who was still in his teens, was serving with the Kansas Cavalry. Following his father's death, Bill secured employment as a carrier boy on the supply train. Later, at the age of 14, he obtained a lucrative job as a rider for the Pony Express. Bill made the longest trip on record. Upon reaching three crossings, he learned that the rider at Sweetwater had been killed, and he was requested to ride the next leg. He made a trip of 321 miles without stopping except for meals and to change horses. At 17, Bill enlisted in the 9th Kansas Cavalry. Later, he served as a scout in Tennessee and as a trooper in Missouri. In 1866, he married Louisa Federici in St. Louis. Bill contracted with the Goddard brothers to furnish the Kansas Pacific Railroad with all the buffalo meat required to feed the laborers engaged in road construction, and in the 18 months, 1867-68, to killed 4,280 buffalo, which earned him the name by which he is best known, Buffalo Bill. 
from September 1869, when he first caught the notice of General Phil Sheridan by some daring riding through Indian country until December of 1872, when he resigned to go on the stage, Cody was continuously on army payrolls as a civilian scout. In July 1869, he achieved some fame for guiding the 5th Cavalry to its spectacular victory at Summit Springs, Colorado. The troops returned in August of 1869 to Fort McPherson, Nebraska. Cody felt sure enough of his employment to send for his wife. According to Mrs. Cody, when she saw him at Fort McPherson for the first time, he was wearing long hair, a mustache, and a goatee, the style of a prairie scout of those days. In September, while buffalo hunting with Major Frank North to supply the garrison with meat, Cody and North were surrounded by Indians and barely fought their way back to the command. With the 5th Cavalry, they then pursued the Indians for 90 miles to Standing Rock Agency in Dakota. Finally, the expedition returned to Fort McPherson on October 28th. Within less than three weeks, Captain W.B. Brown. Brown organized in his quarters the Plault Valley Lodge, number 32, of the A.F. and A.M. under the jurisdiction of Grand Lodge of Nebraska. Cody and Brown were close friends, and it is likely that Cody petitioned right away for membership. One of the officers of the lodge was the post's physician, Dr. David Frank Powell. Powell, later known as White Beaver, became fast friends with Buffalo Bill and eventually died in Cody, Wyoming. On his 24th birthday, Cody was elected to membership. He was initiated March 6, 1870, and passed to the degree of fellowcraft April 2, 1870. During 1870, Cody was involved in only one official Indian fight. However, he was kept busy hunting and guiding visiting dignitaries. One of those dignitaries, Professor Nathaniel Marsh, a Yale paleontologist, was on his way to the Bighorn Basin to do some dinosaur bone hunting. It is Marsh whom Cody credited for exciting his interest in the Bighorn Basin country. Cody also served in the capacity of Justice of the Peace at Fort McPherson. He had been appointed by the Army commander because he was the most reliable of the local civilian employees. In addition to performing routine chores such as marriages, whom God and Buffalo Bill have joined together, let no man put asunder, Cody also served as a sort of unofficial detective and policeman. Certainly, one of the biggest events in his life was the birth, late in the year, of his only son, Kit Carson Cody. On January 10, 1871, Cody was raised to the sublime degree of a Master Mason. Within a few months, he was cited for conspicuous and gallant conduct for a skirmish on the Birdwood Creek, Nebraska. He also began to achieve wider national fame as a guide for distinguished hunting parties. In September 1871, he led the famous Bennett Jerome Hunt, which resulted in an invitation to New York. General Sheridan was so pleased with his conduct of that and a subsequent hunt that he asked Cody to guide the Grand Duke Alexis of Russia in January of 1872. Three months later, in April, Cody was awarded the Medal of Honor for a skirmish while on a detached duty with the Third Cavalry. Finally, in 1872, he accepted the invitation to go to New York. There, he saw himself portrayed in a stage play and was persuaded by Ned Buntline to star in a drama written expressly for him. From that time forward, he and his partner, Texas Jack Omohundro, spent half their lives on the plains and half on the stages of all the major cities of the East. Cody founded his famous Wild West show in 1883. In 1887, he took the show to Europe for the first time to be the featured attraction during the celebration of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Though he remained in England as the toast of British society through October, he petitioned Euphrates Chapter Number 15 Royal Arch Masons of North Platte, Nebraska, by mail in September. Within a month of the closing of the 1888 season, on November 18th, he was advanced to the degree of Mark Master, inducted into the Oriental Chair, and received and acknowledged a most excellent master. On the following day, he was exalted to the Royal Arch degree, in addition to running the Wild West Show, which showed on Staten Island in 1888. Cody was running a stock ranch near North Platte, and traveling back and forth between the East and Far West. Thereafter, Cody petitioned Palestine Commandery No. 13, Order of the Knights Templar of North Platte, in Nebraska, and duly elected and received the illustrious Order of the Red Cross on April 1, 1889, and the following day received the Order of Malta, and was dubbed a Knight Templar, just before sailing once again to Europe. 
This European tour, which began in Paris for the Centennial Exposition, lasted for three years. Cody was back and forth between Europe and America during that time. Just before returning for another tour of England, he petitioned Tangier Temple of the Ancient Arabic Order, Nobles of the Mystic Shrine of Omaha, Nebraska, on March 22, 1892, and walked the burning sands three days later. In the meantime, he had found time a hunting expedition through the Grand Canyon and into the Kaibab country of Utah, serve as a marshal during the inauguration of President Benjamin Harrison, and act as chief scouts for General Miles in a futile attempt to head off what became the Wounded Knee Massacre. 1893 had been his most successful year in show business, perhaps the most successful year in history in outdoor show business. The season of 1894 in Brooklyn promised to be just as good. Cody, by this time, had been seen in person by millions of people on two continents, and his name was a household word. He was well on his way to being the most famous man, perhaps in the world, and certainly the most photographed. The northern jurisdiction of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the Valley of New York City honored Buffalo Bill by conferring all of its degrees in the Lodge of Perfection 4 through 14, the Council of Princes 15 and 16, the Chapter of Rose Croix 17 and 18, and the Consistory 19 through 32 in the same day, April 4th, 1894. This special action by the New York body exemplified their desire, and that of all Masons of that time, to recognize not only Buffalo Bill's dedication to his fraternal duties, but also to acknowledge the adherence to the principles of friendship, morality, and brotherly love. By all accounts, Cody's life provided an exemplary model for Masons. He was a man of his word in his dealings with all people. He dealt with people of all races, religions, sexes, and occupations as equals and was always open-handed in helping those less fortunate than himself. Buffalo Bill gave the last performance of his Wild West show at Portsmouth, Virginia, where he became ill with a cold and headed for his Wyoming ranch. He stopped off at Denver to visit his sister and died suddenly from uremia on January 10, 1917. Although Buffalo Bill left a will stating that he wished to be buried on top of Cedar Mountain, about five miles west of his home city in Cody, Wyoming, he was actually buried atop Lookout Mountain, 20 miles west of Denver, after his remains had lain in state in a bronze casket in the Capitol Rotunda in Denver. A service was held and his body was placed in a temporary vault while a permanent tomb could be cut out of the solid granite atop Lookout Mountain. At the request of Plot Valley Lodge of North Plot Golden City Lodge Number 1 Golden, Colorado, conferred Masonic burial rites on June 3, 1917. Atop Lookout Mountain, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Worshipful Master G.W. Parfit, Jr. of Golden City Lodge No. 1, appointed eight brother pallbearers who were dressed in their Knight Templar uniforms. At the request of Mrs. Cody, and almost five months after his death, the casket was opened, and an estimated 10,000 viewed the dead pioneer and trailblazer. It was estimated that more than 20,000 persons visited the spot, and 15,000 were present at the burial ceremony, having walked or ridden to the top of Lookout Mountain. It was certainly one of the largest, if not the largest, Masonic burial ever. These words were said by the Masons over the grave. His spirit ascends to God who gave it. His memory we cherish in our hearts. His body we consign to the earth." End quote. Before his burial, a group of friends and family members formed an organization to foster and perpetuate the memory of Buffalo Bill in Cody, Wyoming. From this timely but meager start, the world-famous Buffalo Bill Historical Center has developed. And that's it on Buffalo Bill. Now, I think what's interesting is we look at this stuff and we read about these things and we think about them in terms of context of modern day, and we say, well, are these things still Masonic today? Would they still be Masonic? You know, thinking about killing all those buffalo in, in the, the air and society today of conservation and how we've had to deal with all of these things. But I was recently lucky enough to be on a panel with Brother Art de Hoyos. I was interviewing him as well as uh, Kendall and Joseph Wages, and I asked them something about this kind of thing in relation to Albert Pike, and Art de Hoyo said, it's really a mistake to judge the past by the standards of today. And I think that's relevant 
I think it's okay to think about those things, but I don't think it's okay to particularly judge those people on those things all the time. It's circumstantial, I suppose, but certainly some food for thought. And just what an incredible life this guy had. And to think about opening a casket after months of being inside of it. I mean, like, what? Who would do that? This is just a clear case of a guy who passed away and was like a national treasure. So we'll get right into the next paper right after this. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to wcypodcast.com, you can click on direct donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on in the beginning of the program. Of course, you can make that one-time donation or you can sign up to be a monthly contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose, really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com, but also we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beer and skincare. He's been so generous. If you head to wcypodcast.com, click on more, then click on Banker's Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products, skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more then go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to onit.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with john t ruark it is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success so check that out on amazon you can click right to it you can get it on audible kindle or in print even on ibooks and last but not least i want to ask you to check out the great books program you'll see the banner for it on the left hand side intellectual linear progression use the promo code wcy or you can just click on that link there and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from scott hambrick about how awesome the program is so that's it i hope you guys enjoy and thank you so much for helping us out And before we jump right moving forward, I wanted to mention, I was in the Texas Facebook group the other day for Freemasons, and somebody said, if there was only this place where people could go to find guys who are willing to travel around and do talks, well, there kind of is, right? I I built a website, it's MasonicConstruction.com, and if you go there, it's just a listing of people who are willing to travel around and give talks. So if you're featured on this website, awesome. If not, you want to be, contact me. But I want to uh, let you guys know that if you go to this website, if you click on somebody that you want to check out, you can read you can read their bio, uh, their prepared topics, their travel information, their personal websites, and uh, you can email them direct. It doesn't go through me. I don't handle any of this stuff. I just wanted to get a, a general uh, listing of speakers to put up on the website. So check it out if you would like, masonicconstruction.com if you're looking for people to come out and do talks at your lodge. Now, the next piece I've got is called A Focus on Freemasonry, and it's by Herbert A. Ronan, another past Grand Master of Masons in Nebraska and the Chairman Emeritus of the Executive Commission of the Masonic Services Association of America. Again, this is a short talk bulletin that's been adapted from a paper, A Sketch of Freemasonry, which most worshipful brother Ronan prepared for the Scottish Rite several years ago. 
And uh, I wanted to preface this by saying, once again, it's not my intention to always read Short Talk Bulletins. I, I do want to give that disclaimer because they do work hard at producing a podcast version of the Masonic Services Association Short Talk Bulletins. So most definitely go to them and check them out, subscribe to them. You can get a really good deal on the MSA Short Talk Bulletins by going through your buddies at the Amity app. You can sign up right there through the application and get them digitally, and uh, you get a good deal on it, and you're helping them out. So without further ado, a focus on Freemasonry. Through the years in our American society, Freemasonry has stood head and shoulders above some 700 other fraternal organizations. It's more than 3 million members today, evidence its impressive size and stature. It has been powerful and instrumentally good because of its great teachings of morality. The kindred fellowship of good men seeking great goals in living has merited the splendid reputation which Masonry possesses. Our members can be justifiably proud of our American heritage, which, in a large measure, is the work and product of members of the craft. The imprint of Freemasonry was indelibly engrossed in the birth certificate of our nation, the Declaration of Independence. This bold document was authored by Thomas Jefferson and was adopted by the Continental Congress, which was predominantly Protestant and whose leaders were members of the craft. Fifty years after its adoption and shortly before his death, Thomas Jefferson penned these prophetic words concerning his crowning masterpiece, quote, May it be to the world what I believe it will be to some parts sooner, to others later, but finally to all, the signal of arousing men to burst their chains under which ignorance and superstition had persuaded them to find themselves and to assume the blessings and security of the government, End quote. The message of Jefferson made inference to those democratic ideas which are the heart and philosophy of our government. Among them are these words, which should be not only familiar, but thoroughly understood by all Americans. Quote, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure those rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, end quote. Later, those rights were preserved in the Bill of Rights, which was added to the Constitution of the United States, which is the greatest document of modern history. William Gladstone, one of England's greatest statesmen, attended to the truth of this statement in these eloquent words, quote, The American Constitution is the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man, end quote. The rights of free men are inalienable because they are given by Almighty God and not by man. The purpose of our government is to protect these rights, which ensure the dignity of man. These constitutional guarantees make it mandatory that our government be one by law and not by man. In 1776, men were governed by the personal rule of kings and emperors, and the declaration of the rights of a free man was revolutionary. It is apparent to us today that these rights are in accordance with Masonic doctrine, which is interwoven into the fabric of the governmental structure of the nations. The hopeful expression of Jefferson that the entire world might be free and possess the security of government to these ends is far from being realized, and undoubtedly he would be grievously alarmed with the formidable and ominous dangers to these sacred rights and purposes of our government. There is a real and vital need of Masons today to be vigilant and alert to safeguard these precious rights from those who seek to circumvent and undermine as well as those who seek to overthrow our form and purpose of government. The average American desires wholesome things in his life. He believes in virtue and the qualities of honesty and decency. He has innate within him the desire to express, to give, and to share his time talent, and substance for assisting those individuals who are truly in need. In recent years, it has become fashionable for too many persons to shirk responsibilities and tasks for the assistance to unfortunate persons and the general improvement of our society. There, too, frequently evolves the decision to let the government take care of these problems. We find excuses to close our eyes and pretend that things are not as bad as they are. Moral and mental laziness have emerged from the course of inaction. 
toward these problems in our communities and even in our immediate families. The ineptness has seriously affected the personal moral responsibility of the individual. These conditions were apparent to the late brother Peter Marshall, Old Monksland, St. James Lodge, number 177, South Carolina, when he made the significant statement, quote, Let us stand for something, lest we fall for anything. We need directive purpose in our striving and endeavors for successful living. We need to be both sensitive and responsive to the needs of others. We need the vision and then to strive to attain great goals in living. The doctrines and brotherhood of masonry furnish guidance, inspiration, and assurance for those who conscientiously seek its truths and live in accordance with its precepts. The organized and unified effort and work of the members of our craft produced wonderful accomplishments in its benevolence and charities, which would be utterly impossible if left to the individual effort and action. The strong bonds of brotherhood are strengthened and become meaningful in this good work. The appeal and call of Freemasonry has ever been in its effective techniques for building character. Masonic law requires that only those of good moral character and possessing an unqualified belief in a supreme being may be admitted to membership. Contrary to most other organizations, membership cannot be directly solicited, and new members are motivated to petition for Masonry by the excellent reputation our fraternity and its members enjoy. This is a fine compliment to Masonry, and is one of those attributes which make it unique. What we believe in and work for determines in a large measure who and what we are. The lives of truly great men attest to this fact. Likewise, masonry opens new horizons for those who will give it the quote-unquote attentive ear, the instructive tongue, and the faithful breast, and who are sensitive for the needs of others and willing to work as a cog in a mighty organization whose designs are honorable and far-reaching. We need, however, to strengthen that which we have. Our teachings must first be significant in the lives of our members before we can discern good effects which would naturally emerge from them. The purpose of this sketch of Freemasonry is not to analyze comparative strength and weaknesses of our fraternity, but to bring into sharper focus its need and the force which Masonry has to offer in the lives of its faithful members. It is a matter of common knowledge how operative Masonry existed for many centuries and that great cathedrals were constructed by these craftsmen. The magnificent structures erected by them before the time of modern machinery testify to the skill and devotion of our ancient craftsmen to their assigned tasks. From this gradually emerged the beautiful symbolism of speculative masonry, which became formally organized in the early part of the 18th century. It has been aptly said that while operative masons built great temples for the worshippers, speculative masonry seeks to build worshippers for those temples. Anyone who is even superficially informed as to the work and doctrines of masonry knows that it cannot be classified as a religion or as a substitute for one. Masonry does engender brotherly love and an adoration to God, which should induce its members to become better members of their church of their choice. The Blue Lodges of Ancient Craft Masonry have three splendid and impressive degrees. The thrust of the Entered Apprentice degree is the teaching of great moral principles by beautiful ceremonies and lectures. These include the four great cardinal virtues of temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice, together with the beloved golden tenets of masonry, brotherly love, relief, and truth. The fellow craft degree emphasizes the importance of the acquisition of knowledge and that with it comes greater duties and responsibilities. The great degree of all masonry is in the sublime degree of a master mason, and this degree reveals the doctrine in a very impressive manner, and also charges that it is incumbent upon all Masons to continually pursue further light as we travel symbolically in our pilgrimage in life from the West to the glorious East. In the Master's degree, we are told to emulate that legendary Master Hiram, who was faithful even though his life was imperiled. It would be well for us today to not only emulate his fidelity and courage, but his industry skill and devotion to his work. Perhaps one of the greatest teachings of masonry is that the building of human character is likened to that of the building of the great temple. If it is important that the best designs, materials, and workmanship should be used in the erection of a beautiful temple, isn't it even more important that the greater concern should be employed in the building of our own character, the temples, which the Apostle Paul to vividly depict as a quote-unquote house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. What we do not understand, we do not possess. Neither can we impart it to others what we do not possess. 
Superficial exposure to Freemasonry will not suffice to achieve even minimum requirements of a real Mason. To be meaningful, it must be more than an intellectual exercise or a passing experience. Ritualism must be supplemented and embellished by explanation, education, personal fellowship before Masonry can become a part of us and its precepts strengthened by performance. The late Roscoe Pound, formerly dean of the Harvard Law School and honorary past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Nebraska, was a great scholar of Masonry as well as of the law. Dean Pound expressed his concept of the meaning of the true acquisition of Freemasonry with these words, quote, Albert Pike taught that the individual Mason, instead of receiving a prestiged Masonry ladled out to him by another, should make his own Masonry for himself by study and reflection upon the work and symbols. He stood for Masonry, built up within each Mason by himself and for himself on the solid foundation of internal conviction, end quote. The penetrating observation of Dean Pound goes to the very heart of Masonry. It also reminds us of the very first lessons of Masonry when we were informed that we must first be prepared to be a Mason in our hearts. Most of us fail to see or realize the full measure of the limited time God has given us because we insist on looking outside instead of within. The greatest problem of our lives lies within us and are concerning ourselves. As Masons, let us be aware that God has built within us meaningful resources for great living. Freemasonry is a virtual treasure house of wisdom, strength, and honesty which upholds good over evil and whose doctrines and teachings have been and are now unchangeable. That gives us vision and purpose and reassurance in time of sorrow or stress. This closing prayer seems appropriate to the tasks that lie before us. Quote, O God, make of us what thou wilt. Guide thou the labors of our hands. May all of our work be surely built as thou the architect has planned. But whatsoever thy power shall make. Of these frail lives do not forsake. Thy dwelling place, let thy presence rest forever in the temple of our breasts. End quote. Well, there you have this wonderful sort of speech probably given to a class at the Scottish Rite or at an annual meeting or something. It's quite a, a rousing speech, one that should evoke feelings of being proud to be a Freemason. But I think what's interesting is he's calling out some of the shortcomings, the fact that we don't have the education, the fact that we don't have the explanation, the fact that we lack some of the social bonds that happen due to the practice of the former two, the explanation and education. So I hear that, and I get excited to go out and give lectures and talk to people. It's what I can do for the craft, and it helps me because I gain perspective from other people. It's kind of what makes this so great. But that's it for this week. So I hope you've enjoyed. I hope I didn't kill you with news and updates. I hope you're still around. <laughs> If you are, consider checking out the Midnight Freemasons, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for new content every single week. Fridays right now throughout the summer, Todd E. Creason has been posting some wonderful articles. So if you're a fan, check it out. And of course, this program is every Sunday at 9.30 Central. And the Masonic Roundtable goes live every Thursday at 8.30. We are moving to a new platform off of Hangouts, mostly because Google is retiring it. So we have to switch from doing it that way, but we will be on the air. We will still be a video podcast. We'll still be live, I believe, and uh, we will still have an audio podcast as well. So while all of that is happening and you're going to all these Masonic conferences, just remember to travel safe, have fun, and we'll talk to you all next week. Stay in the level. For Once Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.